It is good that we gather in the name of Christ our Savior. I'm Gene Liddick, pastor at Shepherdstown Church. Here we are in the sanctuary setting of uh, this lovely church and, and the good people of God who gather here on Sunday mornings at 930. But this is our chance to worship our Lord and to be in the presence of the living God. Therefore, I offer this call to worship. People of God, let you and me, let us come together. Again, we gather to celebrate God's love and worship our Lord. God's wisdom comes from on high. It is the source of that which we learn from and live through, for this is God's way of guiding and teaching us in our journey. So we truly desire this wisdom as we are called to worship the living God. And then this prayer that we will pray together in worship here at Shepherdstown. We come before you, Lord, seeking your wisdom and truth. It is our longing to experience your love. We honor you even as you bless us with your presence. Hear our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I've been a little self-critical. Uh, I viewed my last YouTube video and boy, on one song, I was so off key. So I'm going to limit my singing. Uh, it, it is for us to worship and for you to share with me as, as I sing this, but uh, I don't have the greatest voice, but I do want to sing to honor the Lord. So we try a cappello. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord. He is the mighty King, master of everything. His name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord. He's a great shepherd, the rock of all ages. Almighty God is he. Bow down before him, love and adore him. His name is wonderful, Jesus my Lord. Holy God, gracious God, we come before you in this special moment where we worship you and recognize that you are present to us. For you are always with us. But sometimes we just need to come before you and recognize our need to be present to you. And that is what worship is about. We thank you, Lord, for this special moment where we can come to you with our hopes and joys and our sorrows and our regrets and to worship you in spirit and truth. Oh, Lord, forgive us for our failings in this past week. As I, as I reflect upon that in this message about wisdom, the discernment for wisdom, I recognize, Lord, that I fall so short of of being in your perfect will and living out this wisdom, letting the world's influences affect me too often. And Lord, I suspect that's the case with those who are worshiping with me in, in this YouTube video. So Lord, hear our prayer that, that we are sorrowful for those times we have failed you and fallen short and lift us up. Lift us up to be more fully your people, more in keeping with your will and observant of your vital presence in our lives. So Lord, with, with, that, with that thanksgiving for you hearing our confessions and knowing how we fail and yet you love us, we also lift up before you names of those whom we whisper 
before you that you might touch them with your healing and vital presence. Yes, Lord, you know those needs and you know our needs before our asking. And we pray for ourselves that your ministering spirit might touch us and give us that wisdom that is beyond our own to know the right things to do and how to do them in this life's journey. Well, Lord, that's our prayer this morning. At this time, that we worship you. In the name of Christ our Savior, amen. Second Chronicles is the first text that I read from. It's about King Solomon and now his opportunity to be the leader of Israel, to be its king, and to be accepted by the people. But first and foremost, he wants to be accepted of God. And so we read verses uh, uh, in, from the first chapter of Second Chronicles, verses 7 through 12. That night, God appeared to Solomon and said to him, Ask what I should give you. Solomon said to God, You have shown great and steadfast love to my father David and have made me to succeed him as king. O Lord God, let your promise to my father now be fulfilled for you have made me king over a people as numerous as the dust of the earth. Give me now wisdom and knowledge to go out and come in before the people. For who can rule this great people of yours? God answered Solomon, because this is in your heart. And you have not asked for possessions, wealth, honor, or the life of those who hate you, and have not asked for long life, but have asked for wisdom and knowledge for yourself, that you may rule my people over whom I have made you king. Wisdom and knowledge are granted to you. I will also give you riches possessions and honor such as none of the kings had who were before you and none after you shall have the like. Solomon, blessed of God. New Testament reading comes to us from 1 uh, Corinthians, the second chapter, and I'll read from verses 4 through 9. Paul the Apostle is speaking of, uh, as some are critics of his style of preaching and his voice and uh, many reasons for him, but he makes his defense not of his own to save his ego, but rather a defense for God and the gospel. He, re he wrote this, my speech and my proclamation were not with plausible words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of the spirit and of power, so that your faith might rest not on human wisdom, but on the power of God. Yet, among the mature, we do speak wisdom, though it is not a wisdom of this age or the roars of this age who are doomed to perish but we speak God's wisdom, secret and hidden, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understand this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor human heart conceived, what God has prepared for those who love him. God's word. 
for you and me, God's people. Thanks be to God for his holy word. Amen. Lord, as, as I offer this meditation and reflection, uh, cause my words to be your words as, as I want to be within your will as I speak of wisdom and seek to interpret the scriptures for the edification of the people of God and for my own teaching that I might learn from this as well. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, there's, there's principle, and then there is reference. I go back to uh, when I was a young adult and, and was a, a newly, uh, well, newly born again uh, believer in Jesus Christ. And I became involved in the local church because now I knew why I needed to be there. And as a young adult in my church, I was asked to be a part of the, of the um, uh, ministry of the church, working in ways to serve God and to be uh, part of committees and, and the like. And so I was uh, representing a social concerns committee as I went to uh, the church council, the, then called the administrative board at my home church called Derry Street. And uh, I was to present on behalf of the chair of that committee a need for Vietnam refugees. Now, it was about 1973, uh, 72, after the Vietnam War, and there were a number of refugees from Vietnam who had settled in the United States and needed a place to stay and needed sponsors to that end. I presented that on behalf of the chair of the committee as the, the area group who was trying to coordinate this, Christian Churches United, uh, was seeking to have churches be part of this response. Well, there was much debate, questions about, well, how much responsibility do we have? Do we have to find them a home? Do we pay their rent? Uh, do we have to find them a job? Uh, this, is, uh, this could be a lot of expense. This could be risky. Now, I wasn't sure if the church should do that. I was a young man. But what I was hearing, all of this negative uh, speech in, in this debate was that uh, we can't afford it. But could they really? Were they just closing their minds to the potential of doing this because it involved maybe a risk? Well, they voted it down. And then the next item on, on the agenda, ironically, was about a pictorial directory. And after a brief discussion, they decided, oh yeah, we want to do the, the directory and we want to uh, approve $300 to be sent. Yeah, big money then, uh, you know, 1970s. Big money, uh, $300 sent to the uh, company that did the pictorial directories. <laughs> a little aside, that company went bankrupt. <laughs> Anyhow, when they took the vote, I had voting rights, and they voted, all voted yes except me. I raised my hand. I said no, and I want to be recorded as such. And that's all I could say because I saw the double standard here. I saw the hypocrisy. I, I saw that they were not seeing how they could be about ministry and then that were self-serving. Oh, I couldn't say that. I got so upset that all I could say was, register me as such. <sighs> knowing the right thing and knowing what to do is about being people who are discerning in wisdom. Now, I was a young man and I had lots of room to grow, but there is this understanding that we, whether we're new Christians or we've been part of the community faith for a long time, we have to practice the principle of faith. We have to seek God's wisdom and not, and not do the popular thing the, that we think is the right thing or, or follow the popular cause or, or be compromised, but rather we need to seek out 
the wisdom of God in all things that we do. Sometimes we might be part of the popular thought. Sometimes we might be up against it. But we need to be discerning and understand what God's direction is and seek that wisdom that God would give for discernment. Well, surely we want the wisdom that uh, Solomon had. I mean, my gosh, we, we read the, of, of this one who is king of Israel, and the powerful moment comes. He has uh, spoken before the people, and that night, that night, God speaks to him in a vision. God knows Solomon's heart, and he knows as God has, is speaking to him in this vision, he asks God, not for wealth, not for prosperity, not that he might be a success, not that his people would, would honor him, or that he would have long life and health and all of that. No, he asks for wisdom and discernment, good judgment. For these were the things that he desired so that he would be a faithful king and live for his people and guide his people forward as king of Israel. Well, God heard him. It wasn't about the right thing. It was about the God thing that the Lord gave to him and said, yes, I will give you wisdom, but more, I will give you prosperity because you will prosper in your faithfulness to the word and you will be therefore blessed. You know, today, uh, in this modern era, perception is so much more important than uh, image, than what we are at core. I, I'm saddened to say that. I'm troubled by that. And yet sometimes I fall into the same trap of being part of the popular or uh, thinking that I'm doing the right thing instead of attuned to the God thing, to true wisdom that is found in God's word, this biblical understanding that is the foundation, the foundation for discernment and how we might live informed by the Holy Spirit. Well, this true wisdom Paul speaks of as well, as we read in, in the New Testament reading from 2 Corinthians, for there is, the, you know, in the, even in this modern era, those who can speak with eloquence, those who, who weave messages that, that cause people to go, oh yeah, that makes me feel good. But it's not about feeling good. That is this gospel good news. It's not about, oh yeah, I, I, I get it, and, and I, I have it here, and I can do this. For those in, in Paul's day, as well as in this modern era, are those who say that the gospel is too simplistic. Jesus dying and somehow taking on our sins. For those who are cosmopolitan, sophisticates, they see things as, as well, that's, that's childish, that's ABCs. We need to be people who uh, have a different perspective, that we use our intellect and, and, well, we're the intelligent, we're the elite. I go back to that same period in time. I remember one of my first jobs. I was working uh, in a state office at the time, a new believer. And I had, well, at lunchtime, I decided that uh, while I was eating lunch, I, I could read the word. I had been doing that uh, for a number of months, and I wanted to do that at lunch, continue to do that at lunch. What well, the trouble was, the people walked by, and they could see me doing that. And it wasn't that I was trying to show that I was, oh, this wonderful Christian. I was trying to grow in my journey. Well. The folks that I was working with, 
decided that they were going to have a, a little fun with me. The, my supervisor shows me a picture of an angel in the clouds, and, and it was the time of, of the Agnes Flood uh, in Harrisburg. And, and he says, hey, did God bring on this destruction? They wanted to show that I was this naive, uh, simplistic personality. Being a new convert, I, I didn't know what to say. I didn't know how to, to, to handle what they were putting forward at me. And I guess I'm thankful that I didn't because I probably would have made a fool of myself trying to explain my way through. But now, as I'm more mature, as, as I've dug into the word more fully, I know that they, what they thought was simplistic, what they saw was Jesus' gene, was in, for me the growing edge of my understanding, coming to maturity and understanding the wisdom of God, that now I, I can say that mystery that Paul spoke of is is etched in my heart. I know that mystery, that mystery of, of why God would cause before time, before all creation, knowing how humanity would go, that God by his design would send his only begotten son, that he might die for me and you. And that if we receive him into our lives, if we come to a faith relationship, if we are transformed by his love, we will then have this, this experience of God in us and live faithfully for God as a result, having the wisdom that is beyond human understanding, far deeper than human intellect. That grew upon my spirit over the years, and now I proclaim to you that I understand this mystery as the testimony of God, of what God does for us, and how God works and moves through us and restores us and all of creation in the process. The gospel bears witness to this, and I have discovered this wonderful good news long ago that keeps growing in my spirit to deepen my understanding of this journey of faith, deeper truth in this divine revelation. Well, that mystery, that testimony of God's doing is that which Paul emphasized, and it is this elementary understanding, not foolishness, elementary understanding of God's grace that brings spiritual maturity. And the word maturity in the Greek New Testament is teloi, which is uh, the root word for the modern words that we use out of the Greek language, telescope, to see deeper, longer, further into the future, to move toward maturity is that, is that deeper wisdom that comes to us that was once hidden and now revealed through Christ unto his creation, unto those who would believe in him you and me. I pray you as, as you know him so well. And if you don't, all you need to do is ask him to enter into your life that he might come alive in you and discover this transforming power of Jesus' love. So here's the choice. We can go in, in one path of preference or another ethical and moral choices involved in this. Dare we ask of God what Solomon did for wisdom and, and justice and, and understanding the discernment of those? Or do we go to path that is compromise? It is the intellect of the world and, and it fails us. Well, you know, obviously, that the decision then is for wisdom insight from God that informs our lives, principled lives, of the believer who keeps growing in grace and God's love. Lord, may this, may this understanding of God's wisdom 
guide us in our journeys. When we fail, you'll lift us up. And we know that mystery of Christ's love for us keeps us strong in the faith, growing ever more, maturing along the way. And we pray your wisdom would guide us, not just today, but in the days ahead. I ask in Jesus' name, amen.